Okay, maybe we can uh, start. So today we introduced yet another uh, ingredient in our uh, list of tricks and ideas to build algorithms, and the keyword here is going to be projections. Okay, I want to see how you can toss in the idea of projecting data and how we can use it in the different contexts. Specifically, we are going to not consider just any projection, but we're going to consider specifically at some point random projections. And we'll see that this is connection what you what you might call sketching. Uh, an interesting bit is that you know I was looking back at this uh, the slides of this class, and uh, we're going to discuss PCA, and we're going to there's going to be just a warm up, and we're going to actually notice something that is a little less known, which is that PCA is equivalent in some precise sense to ridge regression and the gradient descent learning that we introduced in the last few classes. We're going to see how it is connected to um, sketching and the nonlinear version of sketching, which is random features. And this is actually not too far away from neural networks. And then we're going to go on and discuss the last bit of sketching, which is the one based on data. And then we're going to introduce uh, what is sometimes called Nystrom subsampling or column subsampling, which is yet uh, another idea. So we're going to somewhat put together uh, quite a bit of a list of uh, topics that are sometimes uh, uh, presented in a, in a separate way. Uh, let me uh, uh, wrap up a bit uh, um, what we have done so far in terms of building algorithms. Uh, on the one hand, we consider ERM that we did at large. So this is based on the minimization of a loss. And we did so far, we're going to keep on just considering linear models and because they can be extended to a linear model with kernels and features in exactly the same way. Okay? And then we consider the possibility of adding a penalty or a norm that we interpret as a way to stabilize the problem both numerically and statistically, if needed. <coughs> and then we actually consider, because this is a an optimization problem. This is what you call an algorithm in a statistical sense, but it's actually an optimization problem. We actually consider primarily, um, well, let's try to be precise for one, first order methods, meaning iterative procedure based on knowledge or partial knowledge of the, um, of the derivative of, of, of gradients, okay? And so we actually build sequences So let's give a name to this guy. And in the simplest case, we put here the gradient of this regularized objective function. But we have seen that if the gradient doesn't exist, but the function is convex, you can actually use the subgradient. And we have seen that if the gradient is too costly to compute and you cannot wait to compute the gradient before updating your solution, you can use stochastic gradient descent, OK? So if you want, this is it's one principle divided in two bits, the design of the objective bit and the numerical bit, OK? Somewhat taken separately. The modeling aspects and the numerical aspects are somewhat separated. Last class, we introduced uh, a really a different uh, idea, which is what uh, today we're going to call uh, with the 1950 name, which is iterative regularization. Uh, almost. OK. Which is, roughly speaking, the idea that rather than doing this thing in two steps, you can actually take one step. You can write one optimization procedure that is going to uh, explore the same set of solutions that you explore with this method by varying lambda. So we mostly justify the least square case, but let me just write in a more general term today. This is the idea of using something like this.
So you take the gradient of the unregularized empirical risk. So vis-a-vis, -vis, there is no obvious explicit constraint or penalty on the form of the solution. But hopefully at this time, uh, at this point is clear, the gradient descent itself has an implicit bias regularization. You remember what that means? Not only does converge, but it converts to certain solutions, particularly in the case of least square, you show that these are the minimal norm solution, exactly the same that happens for this when lambda goes to zero. But more than that, the path of solution that you obtain by varying t resemble the path of solution you obtain solving this for varying lambda. So not only you have a bias, but the iteration somewhat can control the complexity slash stability robustness of the solution as the iteration goes on. Okay. <coughs> so far so good. And these are really two different principles. Okay. The the of course they can might and can have some common derivation, but they're just two separate ideas. Again. If we finish our discuss, we, we introduced this only for least squares, linear least squares, okay? And we all, and commented briefly on how general this is. And the, argument, the, the idea, uh, well, the point I tried to make is that I think it's really very general, okay? And then you can ask me for which one we proved stuff and for which we didn't prove stuff, which is a bit more than the idea holds in general or not. And I think for most models, this, empirically, you can check that this actually can do stuff. Uh, from the discussion we had last time, least squares, you can go for free to nonlinear model using features and kernels. Going to non-general loss function is also pretty immediate. You can basically take whatever we did there and uh, just set lambda equal to zero. And then you can again expand that. So like what we said last time, you can expand that story in, th in th three, four different directions. One is uh, uh, different optimization techniques, not gradient, but accelerated gradient, stochastic gradient, mini batch gradient, and so on and so forth. Okay, and ask, do they implicitly regularize? And the answer is yes, but the exact inter and you can ask now the interplay between all the quantities, right? The mini batch size, the step size, the number of steps, the kind of sampling you do, and we only know even in simple sentence like this course, we don't know the answer to all these questions. Okay. So one is optimization, generalize that to different optimization. Another one, other loss functions, and we touched upon that a little bit. Then you can talk about different norms, but we haven't even done it for this. So you can do it, but we, I'm gonna maybe mention this, um, I guess it's next class. Um, and then the final bit is different loss function, a different class of functions, and we said uh, it's uh, um, easy with what we learned so far, what we described so far. Uh, for, for features and kernels, if you use nonlinear uh, parameterization, like in the case of uh, um, neural networks, it's trickier, but there has been a ton of work uh, in the last, let's say, 12 months, okay? And so at this point, um, the fact that this is at work in very venerable, you know, in a very large, broad class of problems is pretty clear. What we want to do today is just introduce something else. And the, the, I guess the starting point is, uh, um, well, I guess one way to present this is when you marry optimization and statistics through this, you get kind of a nice fact that the parameter becomes one. So there is, you don't have a one parameter to control stability and one parameter to control the complexity in terms of uh, um, number of operations. Here, they became the same guy. Okay. Here you, you think of controlling fitting stability bias with lambda, and then you think of controlling the number of operations you do with t. But here there is just t. So in some sense, we have this uh, uh, conflation of statistical and computational aspect through one parameter. Okay. But here computation means time complexity. Okay. Just time. So a natural question is what about uh, memory? Okay. And this is not uh, uh, just for the sake uh, of uh, you know aesthetics, but the point is that you know in, in modern in everything we've seen so far, you have either to deal with this matrix, or with this matrix, or oh, remind me for the whole day to do this. D 
This is n by d. And then can, you can figure out the other two. And the, it, the point is that if uh, you really have to work with the n and d, maybe not the same, but large, uh, then memory becomes oftentimes the bottleneck. Okay, if you see a lot of the things we've been uh, discussing, rec even the simplest one, require a substantial amount of work if you have to start to deal with, say, a data matrix, which is a million by a million. Okay, so the problem is way beyond just pure statistics because just handling the matrix is complicated. And many of the algorithms we've seen, particularly kernel methods, um, they somewhat died out, not even because they don't work, but because you don't have them anymore, in a way. Okay, in the sense that if you have to deal with a matrix which is n by n, and n is a million, and you have to invert the matrix, diagonalize the matrix, it becomes uh, a challenge for current uh, you know, scientific computing and, and numerics. Okay? And uh, uh, so one question is can, how to deal with this, uh, with this uh, memory constraint. Okay? How to try, you know, of course, one way to go is to basically try to say, OK, I'm going to go stochastic gradient. I'm going to look one point at a time. But still, the idea is that when d is ginormous, maybe you would like to somewhat look just at set of coordinates at the time. And maybe figure out that you know, the data is are not big because we just all single bit of information is useful, but it's just because we take the kitchen sink like approach. We take as much data as we can and as many features as we can and we hope for the best and then we just go and take um, a few more layers. We pay a few more GPUs, cross our finger, go for a run, then see what happens, okay? But maybe Maybe the data can be treated in a more efficient way. And today, we want to try to get an idea of uh, how to reduce size. Okay? And basically, it's the idea of dimensionality reduction, if we wish. And projection and dimensionality reductions are go hand in hand. So um, we're going to consider a simple idea. And the basic idea is u of x. It's big. Let's make it smaller. How do you make it smaller? You multiply this by another matrix. This is n by d. This is d by m. And we're going to take m. The intuition is that m should be small. What does small means? Well, smaller than d, maybe even smaller than n. Okay. If you don't make it much smaller than d and n, you know, ideally, I guess we want much smaller than both. And we're not going to be too precise about who's smaller than who and blah, blah, blah. Okay, so we just think of them being both 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 big, and we're just going to try to make them smaller. And uh, I want we want to remember that uh, m is the um, size by which we shrink our problem. And in this case, we're going to consider shrinking or shrinking, you know, reducing the dimension on the on the d side. Okay, not on the subsampling of the points. Suppose that you do this, okay? Suppose that you have a way to do this. Then one way to learn is essentially by considering, again, ERM. So we go back. We, we don't immediately mix up all the ingredients, okay? So we go back to the basic ingredient, and the basic ingredient is ERM, okay? So we're going to, if you take this trick and you want to combine it with the first idea, you can just uh, combine it with ERM. And in the case uh, of least squares, this is easy to write because the problem you have to consider is simply minimum but now w belongs to our m okay and again, you can Im if you don't uh, want to work with least squares right away, you know, you just replace it with any other loss function. Okay, and the idea is that if we now have to deal with data that are much shorter, this is going to cost us less. Okay, both in terms of time and memory, especially. It's a matrix that we're going to spend uh, an hour to talk about how to choose. That is uh, d by m. So when you multiply this, you get something smaller than the original matrix. No, no, it's a matrix, as in a bunch of numbers. Okay. How do I 
Say it again? Of what? Same as? Okay. So the first question was, what is S? And the answer is, for now, it's a matrix. Okay, And then we're going to discuss how to choose it. The second question is, what's W? It's just any, it's a dummy variable here, right? It's, I, if you want, and if I shorten the data, I also shorten the Ws. Okay, So my W is shorter, my X is short, and I just find F of X, which has to be W transpose X, is W short. Xm, which is a short version of X. And so here the minimization is over Rm, okay? And just a new set of parameters, okay? Same. Okay? Okay, the question becomes how to choose S, okay? How, how do you pick S, okay? And I guess the simplest way is PCA. What's PCA? You can describe PCA in, uh, in a bunch of different ways. You can talk about the variance. You can talk about projecting data. You can also, th one way to think about it is that if you have a matrix and you try to find the best rank M approximation of the matrix, the thing you should do is diagonalize the matrix or take the singular value decomposition of the matrix and then keep the first, whatever is the rank you want, number of columns, okay? This is the point of view we're going to take here. So again, reminder, PCA. And again, bear with me, PCA here is just a, a warm up, OK? And we're going to just uh, look at it quickly, seeing how you can massage it a bit. And the, if you want, the interesting bit here is that it is going to be the same as gradient descent and Tikhonov in uh, 20 minutes, 15 minutes, OK? Um, What's the idea? Pick x, take the singular value decomposition, OK? So this is a, a what is it called, the compressed form of the SVD. So this is going to be a, um, the, what we care about is that this matrix is a matrix whose columns are an orthonormal basis of um, Rd or a subset of Rd if the rank is smaller, of the rank of this matrix is smaller than D. Okay. So what's the idea? The idea is that uh, there is a precise sense in which the best thing we can do if we want to preserve this is to project on V. So we're going to use that projection. Okay. So we're going to denote by Vm. This is the uh, D by M matrix made of M columns of V, OK? So the first M are not just uh, a set of bases. Are the first column is the one associated with the largest singular value, which is the largest principal components, and so on and so forth. They're ordered, right? So effectively, what I did here is that, in some sense, I said, if the eigenvalue is small, a single value is small, I, I can uh, take it away. So this is, uh, I would argue, is the most basic way to do dimensionality reduction. How? Well, because now you what you can do is that you can project the data. You can take, uh, if the idea is that, that let's take S to be VM. OK? And let's see what's happening, what's going to happen. Yes. Right, that's a good point. So um, I'm always sloppy about uh, the offsets and the centers. The, cent for the, in the, the question is, what about the mean centering business? <coughs> I think the, you know, the, the, the short story is when data are sufficiently high dimension, it doesn't matter. Okay? So the idea that there is an offset and there is an origin, which is really important, is really a low dimensional idea. And it's true. If you're in dimension two, three, four, or five, it really matters. Okay? But if you're dealing with tons of dimensions, just think in terms of linear system, it's just one extra degrees of freedom, half of a thousand, it doesn't really matter. If you work with big models, like no linear model, like features kernels, it doesn't matter. Okay? So that's, uh, that's how I think about it. I think it's what uh, I think you know, I want to communicate as the important bit here. And making this statement precise takes a bit of work. You have to somewhat quantify what's going on. Um, if you wish, and if you don't like this question, the idea could be, well, let's you might want to recenter things. Or instead of call it PCA, let's just call it 
the SVD of X, okay? So and what do we lose is that, uh, so maybe we can do this. We cannot think if we just don't recenter, what can happen? Essentially what can happen is that if the data are very well far away from the origin, the first eigenvector is gonna be the mean instead of being uh, the way they're elongated, right? So you first have to get to wherever the points are. You know, imagine that again. Okay, in some sense we like this. Well, of course, I took the only example where they're all the same, but. <laughs> we would like these to be the principal component, but we put the data there. So with respect to this origin, this is the first direction is very far away okay so i first go there then i go in the orthogonal direction and we we'll get the right thing so it just creates a bit of unbalance okay so we don't care it's not the main point here if we center we can call the first eigenvector so first the singular va vectors and uh, the principal components otherwise we can just call it the svd okay okay now if we make this choice. Now we can somewhat um, elaborate on this a little bit, okay? So the first observation is that we can write XM. Maybe I want to do this first. If I have this, I want to use a couple of different expression I can derive from this one. The first one is that I can write what X transposes, and it's just gonna be V sigma this, okay? And then notice that if I want, what I can do is also that from this expression, I can multiply from the right by U, and then by sigma inverse. Okay, and now I can express V in terms of uh, X transpose, okay? So what I can do is V equal X transpose U sigma to the minus one, okay? And so what I can do also is to say, okay, I can now also take the first M. What I can do is that I can take this matrix, but now take only the first M elements of this by essentially padding this, just instead of taking a diagonal matrix, I make it rectangular with just a bunch of things on the diagonal, in which case uh, I'll be able to write this as X hat, u m sigma m to the minus one okay so i'm just taking the first m um, elements of u and the corresponding uh, uh, singular values Oop. okay is that clear why do we care about this because now we can give the expressed in explicit form to the projections okay and we do this essentially because this is gonna be useful and we can then elaborate, we can get for free a couple of things. A, the kernel PCA version of this, and B, uh, we can work a bit out uh, the explicit form of this minimizer, okay? <coughs> so, if you take XM, XM is gonna be what? It's written somewhere there, okay? It's X set, and then I have to multiply by this. So I get X hat, X set transpose, UM, sigma M minus one, okay? But uh, this is exactly the matrix which is diagonal on UM, okay? UM are the singular vectors of X are the eigenvector of X, X transpose. So when this sees this UM, it spits out a sigma M, okay? Square, because these are not, these are the eigenvalue, the, eigen, the singular vectors are the eigenvector, the eigenvalues are the square of the singular values. 
So this is going to be k hat u m equal u m sigma m square. With sigma m square means that I take each entry of this diagonal of this um, I guess block diagonal matrix and I write square, which means that this is just equal to u m sigma m. Okay. So this is the expression in which you project the data. Okay. The data in the training set. K is the kernel matrix, okay, or the gram matrix, if you wish. Now I call it K, even if it's linear, is the matrix of inner products of everybody against everybody. Is that okay? So K hat ij, in this case, is just xi transpose xj. Sorry? I didn't hear the question. Because it's true. <laughs> you can prove it, isn't it? No, it's just uh, it's just that you know. It's, so let me give you the Italian explanation. When you have a matrix like this, okay, you can do the singular back to the composition. Then you can make it like this, and you got this guy here. Then you can also do this matrix, okay? Or now it gets difficult. This matrix. Yes, OK, that was my intent. Now, the, you can check quickly that if, when you have a rectangular matrix, OK, you have singular ve values and eigenvectors, OK? If you now form the square matrix, these guys are going to be this eigenvector of the d by d matrix, OK? I understand. See? Be That's good. <laughs> so if you have the, again, so. Let me write it here, OK? So this is u sigma v transpose. <coughs> the eigenvalue of this are sigma square, and the eigenvectors are v. The eigenvalue of this are also sigma square, and the eigenvectors are u, OK? That's what we're using here. And why that's true is because uh, you can check. You just take this, and you plug it in, and you find out that it's true. OK? And so here I'm just using the fact that the matrix that I got here is really just the inner product matrix. And so I can simplify the expression a little bit. Oops. OK. So this is the projection of the training set. OK? What about the projection of any point? If I take any point, non in some sense, this magic that these things goes away is because I'm projecting the training set. So I'm using the training set to build the projection, and then I'm projecting the training set. And notice that all I have to do to project the training set, I don't even have to make a multiplication. What I do is that I take the inner product matrix, I diagonalize, and I take a chunk of eigenvectors and, uh, and uh, eigenvalues. That's it. OK? But what if I have to project a new point? Uh, let me give this, this. Yes. But there's. So the question is, why do we pick VM uh, as to be just this? And the answer is, if I ask you, so think about this, what is the question. I give you a data matrix, and you want to project it, OK, to make it smaller. How do you want to do it? Would give, you know, what do you know that could somewhat guide the, the intuition of how you make a matrix smaller? I think the average person here probably unless he goes nuts with uh, some more fancy, you could say PCA. Why? Because that's the way in which you preserve most of the variance, geometry, reconstruction. You know, tell me the one that you like, but it's all the same of the matrix. And so that's what we're doing right here. Other choices could be 
you can do random projection. For example, you can try to just hit the matrix with a bunch of random vectors. Or you can do a ResNet with 10 layers, 1,000 layers, and do some autoencoders, which you can also do, OK? But we're not going to do it now, just because we want to consider a simple idea. So in some sense, why do we choose it like this? Because arguably, if you think of reducing the size of your matrix, that's kind of the first basic idea, because it's a good reason. It's the best way to get the rank M approximation of this matrix. So this is not a particular intuition. Just there is a mathematical fact, which is that this particular choice of V is the one that, in a precise sense, preserves most of X. And so we start from that, because arguably that's the default choice. Okay. You have to be a bit careful, but essentially, yes. Mm -hmm. Oh, but I don't know. I think it's operator norm, but it might be, I don't know, actually. I think it's operator norm, but what you get is the, is the large, I don't remember. You remember, it's the same. I don't know. The, yeah, probably they give you the, probably the, 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 what he's saying, which I believe, and I don't remember, is that the, 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 the error is going to be different because you're measuring different norms, but you get the same minimizer, so you get the same answer. But my answer is I don't know because it's safer. Okay? But there is one norm. It's either one of the two. Okay? So the whole point that there is a norm under which you can make the statement precise, but you can also, again, it's just one way, okay? Because I think most of you probably didn't see that point of view. You just see the point of view where you say, I, I see a certain that as a measure of variance, and I try to minimize the variance. Or among all the direction in which I can project the data, let me find the direction where I preserve the length of the vector most, okay? These are two other ways. So anyway, so these are all reasons why that's not the right choice. is arguably the basic choice, okay? Now, the other point we want to make is uh, we can define uh, uh, now how to take x, okay, and send it into a short version. And what we want to do is that we want to take x and multiply it by all the coordinates, say, v1 to vm, okay? That's how you get uh, that's how you get the short version of any x, okay? So if you now plug in this expression, or rather, no, it's there. This expression in here, you're again going to get inner product, okay? And you're going to get a somewhat a simplified expression. So what you get is the following. I just write one component. And one component is given by sum i from 1 to n, x transpose x i, u, j, i, sigma, j. Okay? We skip the derivation. I just give you a hint of how to get it, and we comment on what are the different symbols that appear. Okay? How do you get this? You simply plug, you take a column of this, and you multiply by x, and then you verify that this is the expression you get, OK? This is sensible, because we, are, we have an x here, and we, have, we multiply this by x transpose, OK? And then we just have the eigenvectors and the eigenvalue. If it's like taking a column of that, which basically we take instead of the um, sigma m to the minus 1, we just take the first column and the first um, singular vector, singular values. OK? So what do you get? You have to multiply the new x for all the x's in the matrix. And then you just have to look at one. You see j runs uh, over the direction in which you are uh, projecting. And so uj is just one. Uh, singular vector, and the uji are its components. How long are the vectors? Let's just check that this makes sense. How long is u? u is n by the number of points you take, in this case, m. Okay? So each of the m vector has length u. And so I'm going to multiply each of these inner product with the corresponding entry in the vector. I take the first point, I take the first entry of the eigen vector, and so on and so forth. And then I divide by the corresponding singular value. 
Okay. So we're, again, we're not deriving, we're just checking that at least from a dimensionality point of view, it makes sense, okay? And deriving is just uh, uh, an one extra step and we're skipping it, okay? Now, notice the following. If you have V, you don't need to do this and you don't need to do this. This just gives you a different way. You remember the whole story why we introduced representer theorem for least squares was you can make a matrix, you know, you have the matrix which is D by D, but if N is much smaller than D, you don't want to work with the D by D matrix. So let's try to do an algebraic trick to work with the smallest matrix, okay? Here is kind of the same thing. If I give you a matrix which is very flat, so it has very few rows and very many columns, you don't want to just build the, you know, if I give you a matrix which is 10 by a million, you don't want to build the million by million matrix and diagonalize that. And here just, we just proved that you can do the same trick we did for regularized least squares for PCA, okay? How is the story? If you, if you compute this directly, okay, then you can just apply it, okay, straight to a data matrix or to a new point. If rather than doing that, what you want to do, again, think of a 10 by a million matrix, you want to build a 10 by 10 matrix, diagonalize that, find the eigenvectors that are the U eigenvector, and then use them to uh, project down. And here we gave two expressions that allow to do it, okay? So this is the version where I use the Vs, and this is the version where I use the U. So this becomes computation. Which one you want to compute, the U or the Vs, okay? If you, it's one of the two is gonna be cheaper, okay? Here, same, compute the V in this case, or compute the Us, okay? Agree? Can you kernelize this? Can you try to, you know, do this all the same thing with kernels? Yes, it's trivial at this point. What do you do is that you say, in this old story, rather than taking x, guess what? I'm going to take phi of x. And correspondingly, I'm going to take a matrix phi hat, which is n by p. Then I do everything I did upstairs, OK? What's going to happen? If p is finite, I'm good, OK? If p, well, let's just write the one above, OK? I get that the first component of the vector xm is going to be like this. But I, not, I may not be able to write this down in general. So let me just write down. Let's do this notation. So you do this. So let's call phi m x. Okay, is gonna be again. You can take now the just is just the same. You can take the singular the composition of this if you can compute it that you can just write this, OK? But if it's not finite dimensional, you cannot compute this. But what you could do is that you could take instead the matrix, which is given by inner products. And then you can now use this expression that we just Demonstrate it. Again, I, right now I'm just doing symbol matching, right? I'm taking whenever you see x, write phi of x. If phi of x is finite, it's just a different name from the one above, OK? But the mathematical derivation turns out that only requires me to compute this matrix whose entry we can define as kxi xj, and the corresponding computation of the projection can be also just expressed in terms of kernel. So boom, I mean, again, we do this not because kernels are super interesting, but because it takes one line after what we set up. Yes. So the question is, uh, <coughs> should I 
first do the mention reduction, then kernelize, or the other way around. It, there is no, it, it's very problem specific, and there is no general guidance to that. It's, it's very different. The basic intuition here is you do PCA. One way to look at PCA is also that you try to find the hyperplane that best approximate your data, OK? So again, with this not so useful uh, low dimensional low dimensional description. If you assume that your data are close to a line or a plane or any generalization of that, PCA is a good idea. But if your data are, say, banana shaped, what you're going to do is that either you approximate with the line or with this plane, OK? In some sense, that feels like an almost one dimensional data set, OK? But you have to be able to capture nonlinearities. Of course, if you take the data, now map them into quadrics, OK? taking monomials, and now you do PCA in the space of monomials, the intuition is that now you'll be able to capture this as the main direction. And so I just gave you one way to do it, OK? And again, the reason why we did this is not because it's super duper important, but just because it takes one line after we did all this and just is an extra, is it just one extra trick. And this stuff is very much related. Uh, so around the, after 2000 something, there was a big stream of ideas related to manifold learning. And we used to have a class about that. We don't have it. Uh, we, we killed it. Okay. But if you wish, the idea are very much related about that. Okay. The, the, I would say, you know, if you want to trivialize the whole story, is that rather than they're taking a kernel, that of course had to be something nice and nonlinear, if you assume that your data are lying on or close to a manifold, then there is a natural notion of kernel, which is the heat kernel. Okay, long story short, that's a bit what's going on. So if you look at things like I don't know, Laplacian related techniques, okay, they're essentially related to the ideas that you do stuff like this with a very specific choice of kernel, which is some reweighted version of the Gaussian kernel. But you don't call it Gaussian kernel, you call it the heat kernel. And you can give a whole different derivation. From, from a computational point of view, once you know kernel PCA and you look at any uh, Laplacian-based method, they kind of look the same, okay, for a specific choice of the kernel. I'm not trivializing the fact that this gives some good insights. I'm just saying from a pure algorithmic point of view, look at the code, almost the same. You just build, the, you just have to do a pre-step where you compute a certain kind of kernel. Okay. Oh, good. So we did, we did, uh, we did a choice of, okay, this was a bit of a, of a, of a interlude about PCA and kernel PCA, and we just discovered a bunch of, uh, a bunch of tricks, okay? Let's go back to our main story, which is we have a big, large data set, and we want to try to make it smaller. Any question about this before I, I move on? So what we want to discover now is that if we do take S to be not just a matrix, but the PCA matrix, we can actually recover uh, a very famous algorithm. And we see that this is essentially the same as doing Tikhonov or, or gradient descent. Okay. So in fact, what we can do in this case is that we can kill this, just take it equal to 0. Okay, And let's see what we get. We're going to get that we get the vector Wm. Which is just going to be, well, this can do it. I'll do a bit quick because we did a bunch of times. You just take the root of this at t equal to 0. Let's assume that we took m small enough that everything is invertible, where the, line, the, the rows are of the matrix are linearly independent. And so we can, uh, uh, we can just invert. Okay? If it's not, you have to take the pseudo inverse. So this is the solution of that. Okay? <coughs> we want to make two comments. One is, what is this? And the second one, how much does it cost? Let's first ask the question, what is this? Okay? If you. Uh, work a bit, you can show that if you take f of x, okay, it's going to be equal to j from 1 to m of what I wrote a second ago. Okay? 
sigma j u j transpose y hat v j. Let's convince ourselves that uh, we're not going to, again, to prove that, you just have to plug in the explicit, the explicit expression of uh, xm in here and work it out. Let's just do a, a simple like dimension counting to, to, just, uh, to just get a feeling that that's correct. We expect this is a, a v, this is a matrix which is d by m and by m, okay, and it's diagonalized by the f by the v by definition, okay, and inside it has a sigma m square. A v here is going to see another v that is hidden in this matrix x transpose, oh, so that's going to go away, okay, and it's also going to see a sigma m here, so you get a sigma m to the minus square to the minus one from here, a sigma m from here, and so this gives one over sigma, not squared, okay? Then you get the vj that is lying here, the vj disappear from here, and you get the uj that multiplies that, okay? Again, this is, a, this is a hand wavy, but just get a feeling that these are kind of the quantity you expect to have. If you want to, if, I mean, I encourage you to just work it out once, but there's nothing interesting here. But look at this expression. Have you ever seen it before? If we did Tikhonov, the only difference that here, once you work it out, I mean Tikhonov on the original data, not on the projected data, okay? If you do ridge regression on the original data, you get exactly this expression, but here you put sigma j square, uh, sigma j divided sigma j square plus lambda, okay? If you do that kind of stuff like Lan Weber iteration, you get something like sum j from 1 to n, 1 minus step size, step size, sigma j, I'm already screwing up, yes, sigma, too many j's, so this is going to be um, t minus, t minus 1, t, t sigma j, and here I get the sigma j, yeah. Okay, so if you remember Lan Weber, gradient descent, call it however you want, you had this truncated power expansion, okay? It was peak and eigenvalue, do the powers, one minus gamma the powers, blah, 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 and this is what you get, okay? From this point of view, what we just discovered is uh, that uh, now you can ask, okay, do I need lambda here? You remember last time where this is kind of somebody of you noticed, and I really, my heart opened up, that if you do gradient descent and ridge regression, you're kind of doing ridge regression and ridge regression twice. If we were to add a lambda norm here, eh, we would be doing, again, tw two things at the same time that are the same, okay? Because we are doing ridge regression, but this is already like ridge regression for lambda equal to zero. Because this is just another way of filtering out things. This says, when an eigenvalue is small, don't count it too much. That one is the version that kills the small eigenvalues. They don't invert them. They replace them with zeros. That's it. So basically, that filter just says, if an eigenvalue is small, don't even, don't even bother. Okay? Don't, don't put it in. Okay? So it just takes it out. F of x is my estimator. Uh, because they suck. Sorry, I wrote, uh, I wrote the, that's the expression of the, v of the WM, the solution, and I forgot to squeeze it, okay? So this is equal to WM transpose X, and I just forgot to put it in. Okay, yes? So this one, uh, you, you mean the difference between the different filter function? Is that the question? Yes. Yeah, so basically the idea, the comment I'm making is doing this, doing this, and doing this, you can clearly see the similarity. They're all, uh, if you wish, low pass filters that like low frequency and don't like high frequency with the following vocabulary. High frequency are the eigenvectors corresponding to small, eigenvalues, that is the, you know, the uninteresting principal components, and the low frequency are 
the eigenvectors that correspond to large eigenvalues, that is, the principal components. The only difference is in how you do the windowing of the high frequencies. And here, what you do is that it's really like a, you know, a rectangular window. You keep, and then you don't keep anymore. You just, it's just a threshold. It's like a vertical threshold. Or the eigenvalue before m, you keep and you invert them. Or the eigenvalues after m, you don't invert them anymore. You just set zero. Okay? It, they don't show up in the sum anymore. Right. So the question is where there, there, is some, uh, there is some sparsity going on in here. And if you wish, the answer is yes. Hidden, I didn't emphasize too much, but in all the models that we've seen when you do least squares, there is a sparsity assumption, OK? But the sparsity assumption is a very specific. Sparsity is a notion that comes with the basis attached to it, and we're going to discuss next class. Here, the basis is the principal component basis. So in some sense, the point is that all these methods have some notion of sparsity on some basis, OK, the principal components. This one enforce a hard sparsity. It really say, I want uh, to shrink the number of coefficients. Then it's like a soft sparsity. It's just saying, I want to. So they're all rigid. They're all uh, L1-like, if you wish. But these one are like uh, uh, soft sparsity, and this one is a hard sparsity. But it's the sparsity on the same thing, OK? Yes? So here, I kill the small eigenvalues. They don't even show up. So even again, if, a, if a, a singular value was small, it would give them 1 over, say, infinity, just to understand. And so I don't want to see it. So here, I only, the, large, the smallest singular value that shows up is the nth one that I decided that is small but big enough that when I do its inverse, it doesn't create instability. You see what I'm saying? The problem here are not the large eigenvalues are the small eigenvalues because they can create instabilities. Okay? And I'm basically saying, if it's small, I want to throw it away. OK. Now, this serves only as a motivation, because at this point, OK, if you do this, you have to diagonalize. But you see, here, what is the cost of doing this? Essentially, going to be linear in uh, n. And then you get m squared plus m cubed. And then essentially the cost in memory is an m. Okay? So we were able to replace d by m, as you expect, because we chopped down the dimension from d to m. Okay? So if you just look at this, you say, oh, wow, amazing. You know, I really went from n d squared d cube to n m. Okay? And if m is smaller than both n and d, that's great. But there's a catch here, because you have to do this. You actually to have to you know, do the SVD. Okay, and that's as costly as solving the original problem. So this for us is more of an excuse and a motivation to turn off our, turn our brain, but we didn't actually make much progress here. You have to first do the SVD and then project down. Okay? It's a one-off computation, so it's true that if you can do it super efficiently, maybe you can do it once and then use it, but still, we cheated. <laughs> okay. So the question is, well, how can I choose S? Uh, okay. uh, to do kind of the same with what we did, but without having to compute an SVD. Just one small final comment is what we just explained, as usual, as a bunch of names. In statistics, it's called principal component regression. Okay? In linear algebra, it's called TSVD, truncated singular value decomposition. The way I like to think about this is that what we learn is that dimensionality reduction plus unpenalized empirical risk is a learning principle. Okay? It's a way to regularize. If you dim reduce the dimension of your data and you do just empirical risk without constraint, without anything, this shows that it regularizes. So if you do dimensionality reduction, write down a constraint problem, and then solve it by gradient descent, we are doing three times depending how you set it up, you might be doing three times the same exact thing, OK? If you do PCA, ridge regression, and gradient descent, you're doing ridge regression, ridge regression, and ridge regression, OK? Or PCA, PCA, and PCA, 
Okay, so that's that's good to know. Okay, these two th interact. Again, is this a general principle proof for all things? I don't know. For certain things, it's proven for not. You can now pick your favorite dimensional iterator direction. Just do it, plug it in there and see if it works. You can change the loss, you can change the norm, and so on and so forth. But this principle, we we uncover a principle, which is that dimensional iterator reduction regularizes in a very precise sense. Okay, so in some sense, now we have. Uh, that's why projection is in the title. Uh, Constraint ERM, okay, gradient descent, and now we also find out that projections can do the same thing as adding a constraint. Okay, but back to our story. What we want to do now is say, okay, I cannot afford the, uh, I cannot afford the single variable decomposition. Okay, so I, I just cannot afford any of this. Can do it. So what can we do? Or you can say, well, I can try to find the fast way to compute the, the SVD. Sure, but maybe it's not needed. Maybe you don't have to do that. And how do you do that anyway? So the question is how to find the matrix S, okay, to use that will be fast to compute. A very simple idea is take a bunch of random numbers. Take S, okay, such that uh, it's, uh, again, it's D by M. And uh, for example, let's say J are one, okay, or, or maybe even better. Let's just say that the uh, row columns as J are okay. So take the columns of that. I guess the columns we're going to check in a minute to be just uh, Gaussian vectors with identity with identity um, covariance, okay. And then you just use it, okay? You use it like this, the, way, the same way we did. Clearly here, you have to do a multiplication, that's easy. You have to do degenerate the random numbers. That's, you know, it cost a little bit, but not nearly as much to do an SVD. And then you just apply, and then you can apply it here. Of course, you lose this, okay? This is not true anymore, but this computation still holds, okay? Do you need lambda or not is one question. Here we saw that we didn't need lambda, but it was a PCA-based argument going through this. So we lost this. We are not sure whether we need lambda or not. And also, we don't really have a clue. Again, we discussed for a bit why PCA is a good idea to start from. But here is a question of whether this is a good idea in any possible sense, OK? Because it's just a bunch of random numbers, OK? So we don't quite. We don't quite give uh, 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 any proof of that. But the one basic calculation you can do is that if you now take one thing that is easy to see is that take xm and take the inner product with another point, OK? So you take, so that thing is what is called linear sketching, OK? You sketch a matrix, a bunch of random vectors, and you take these sketched vectors, the reduced side version. So one thing you can convince yourself pretty easily is that um, in expectation, this is roughly the same as the original inner product, okay? And we're going to write that down. But if that's the case, it means that you use, uh, you use uh, an, uh, you know, uh, a random computation, but it preserves inner product, which means that it also preserves distances, which means that it preserves norms, which means that it preserves notion of orthogonalities. And so you presumably also preserve notions like eigenvalues and eigenvectors that are based on that, okay? And so at that point, of course, there is an extra approximation you have to deal with, but we might, with some hope, try to use it in that kind of method. Make sense? So if this is true, I can say, well, maybe this is not a bad idea. Of course, this is an expectation, right? Which means that when you actually instantiate and use a specific instance of your dimension sketched vectors, you're going to have some extra variance, OK? But that's. And here, the, the word Johnson Linderstrauss start to you know, float in the air, because that's kind of what Johnson Linderstrauss said. This is like a baby version of that, OK? Turns out that here you just need a little bit of care in uh, normalizing things. but. Uh, remember that what you have here is that uh, um, so x m is just going to be equal to s 
xm based on this definition is going to be equal to this. So now you can plug it in here, and you get that this is equal to 1 over m expectation x transpose s, s transpose x. OK? I just plug this in here. But then I can now, well, I can write this down if you wish, and this become x. Uh, the bar here, x transpose, okay. And then it got 1 over m to m sj, sj transpose. So I plug this in here, and I do it cheating so that I can save one line. Then I remember that this is just the outer product of the columns. Okay, So I can just do the out, so, oh, sorry, in the case of the rows. I can, it's the outer product of the rows. And so this is just the sum of outer products. I use linearity, and I can let the expectation seize this. Okay. Just one second. And this just become the identity, because by assumption, those are eigenvectors whose covariance individually is just the identity. Okay. Again, the step I did here is just I rewrote the inner product. Okay. I use linearity to push the expectation in front of the matrix, which is actually random. This matrix is the sum of rank 1 matrices that I rewrote here. So I can push the expectation once more in. And then each of these vectors is a Gaussian vector. So it has identity distribution, uh, covariance, OK? Which means that here I just get identity. I now have an a, a sum repeated here of m terms. I have a 1 over m. So this is actually not more or less. It's actually the same as the original inner product, OK? So if I work in expectation, this is actually inequality, whereas If I just work with the reduced vector, this is going to be an approximation. And the rescaling 1 over m is kind of the right scaling. You should multiply each of the vector you sketch by 1 over square root of m, OK? So that in the large m limits, it goes to the right place. Yes? What was what? These guys? Yeah. Any two vectors. Any yeah, any two vectors. I mean, you, you see from here, it's any two vectors. That's it. So the data are fixed, OK? Data are fixed. They're not random here. They're just a matrix, OK? The only thing which is random is the sketching matrix, which I assume to have um, row, I guess in that case is columns of uh, um, with, that are just standard Gaussians, OK? So it's relatively easy, OK? So this says essentially that, again, it's not PCA, but because we're projecting data in such a way that preserving their product, that's you know presumably you're going to preserve a bunch of other things like orthogonality, eigenvectors, eigenvalues, and in fact this is one way to do PCA as well. You project the data and you compute the the eigenvectors and eigenvalue of this. But here we can use it directly. Okay, we can just plug it in here. It turns out that because we have this extra variability, typically here lambda is needed. Okay, so for PCA. You spend more time doing the decomposition, and you marry your projection to the data, and you don't need lambda. Here, you actually do need lambda. Okay? Why? The intuition is that is because this is just an approximation, and once you actually sorry, this is just an approximation, and once you use this, you have extra variability. Okay? And so you may have to be uh, careful to be robust to that. And again, this is by no means a proof, but it's just an intuition why lambda pops back in. Okay? <coughs> Joseph Linder is essentially 
a refined version of this computation where what you actually do is working not in expectation but with high probability. And you try to characterize the exact number of projections you need to be able to preserve all distances uh, in, without any distortion, both from above and below. But if you want, it's, it's, it's that ingredient, okay? This is just a baby version of that. Okay, maybe we can kill this now and we can call this sketching, linear sketching. Okay. Now you can check from the, I, I'm not gonna write any more about the algorithm because we can check that what was nice in PCA is still there. The fact that now the reduced problem is cheaper. What was bad in PCA, which is that you have to, to compute PCA is gone. Okay. And the, f and the fact that PCA worked is also gone, but hopefully that reasoning t tells you that there is hope to actually prove that it's not completely gone, but you might have to, maybe M has to be a little bit bigger, maybe you have to add a little bit of lambda, but you can still do the job. And indeed this stuff has been proved at least in some cases. Notice that this, all the thing that we somewhat learn more uh, precisely for PCA still holds. Dimensionality reduction is a form of regularization, but it is a kind of you know, stochastic projection that needs a certain amount of extra computations. Now, uh, one thing that I like to, to think about is, look at this algorithm. Depending how much you love constraint optimization or sketching, you can think of this is a regularization. So I guess the normal way to think about it is, this is a way to shrink the data and the reduced dimensionality, use less memory. And this is the guy that controls the statistics of the problem. But you can also think of this is a way to restrict the model because you're just using a W which is smaller, okay? But because there is an extra random, you need to do a bit of preconditioning. You have to ensure some stability. So you can swap in your head, view this as a computational device and this is a statistical device, or you can think of this as a statistical device, reducing the size of your model, and this is a computational device which is ensuring a bit more numerical stability. Of course, you can use them both at the same time. So um, in this technique, is there like a principal way to take M? Because for PCA, you can kind of like look at the sigma values on the details, but here... So the question is if there is a principal way to choose M, okay? And the Subsequent suggestion is for PCA, you can look at the variance. The truth is that in all this story, particularly in the one that is still uh, almost deleted there, the variance or that is not the guiding principle, right? Because who, M, okay, we had lambda here, we had T here, we have M here. So M is lambda, okay? Or if you want as usual, it's one over lambda. So how do you choose it? By cross-validation. I mean, at least in this setting, okay? And now you have two, you have M and Lambda. So how do you choose them? Depends a bit. If you have the time to search for both of them, you do. If you, have, if you just want to go with the biggest memory you can, you just make M as large as you fit in memory and then just, you know, cross-validate Lambda, okay? But you can also try to add memory as much as needed. So you could try to say, I fix lambda, and now I compute the solution for m equal 10, do cross-validation with this solution, then I go from m equal 2 to m equal 20, then I do cross-validation, and I stop when I allocated the memory that gives you the smallest test error. And if you want, this goes back to the original story. We married you know, time and statistics, now we married memory, time, and statistics. Okay? There is one parameter, m, notice the choice of m for Brilliant reason is memory, okay? Is the memory that you allocate to solve the problem according to the test, the needs to achieve the good test error, okay? Okay, fair enough. So in the last 10 minutes, what I would like to do is, uh, um, we, from this you can now depart in a bunch of different directions, okay? One direction we can, can go is uh, to um, choose uh, um, To basically start to, com you can start to complain, okay? As you can always do. You can say, ah, I don't like this because uh, I don't like Gaussians and why Gaussian is a good idea anyway. Sure, that's fine, but I have an extra variability. Is there another way to sample points? Is a way to give a distribution which is not Gaussian, which is better, okay? And long story short, the answer is yes, but you have to look at the data. And then there is a whole game of trying to look at how much you have to look at the data to really have an improvement, okay? And uh, um, the basic thing is to subsample columns sorry, rows of your matrix and use them as your sketching vectors, okay? And that's roughly what is uh, done in Nystrom methods. Again, so you take 
So you, this is x, okay, which is this matrix. You take a bunch of columns here, and you call it s. Okay? Mm, uniformly random, not the first m, right? any of them. And this is basically what an Eistrom sampling does. So you use the data themselves to sketch the data. So you, again, you don't subsample the points. You still use the full training set, but you use a subset of the training set to sketch the training set itself. OK? So that's one possible idea. And uh, it's described in the slides, but I don't, maybe I'll skip that because we don't have time. So what we discuss instead is an extension where rather than doing, and, uh, and this is just one of many things you can do, OK? You can try to get the particular kind of distribution and you know, the fancy uh, ways to use so-called leverage scores, which are particular weights that you can associate to each point, to try to sample in a better way, OK? What we want to discuss instead is uh, nonlinear sketching. Because it turns out that when you do nonlinear sketching, you discover a way to approximate kernel methods that you might call random features, but also you kind of find a way to connect with neural networks. So maybe that's more apt for what's coming later in the course. So what does it mean nonlinear sketching? You did you do sketching, but you do it nonlinearly, believe it or not. Okay? Meaning that you take Xm to be. Just this, OK? So wh what does it mean? You take You take your data points, you did what you did before, but every time you get uh, um, the sketch dimension, you apply a nonlinearity, OK? Which nonlinearity? Well, let's see, you name it, OK? An absolute value, a sigmoid, uh, uh, an exponential, a cosine, OK? That's it, that's the idea, OK? What you get extra is that, again, you're doing in another way what kernel PCA was doing. You're somewhat doing a dimensional iteration, which is now nonlinear. And you can ask yourself in which sense you preserve distance and so on. If you look at the, there is a, a stream of literature in compressed sensing from a few years ago, or like ge geometric embedding, where people were looking at what kind of metric. So this preserves the initial metric, OK, through the inner product. If now I play the same game here, what do you preserve? OK, it's not clear. What I mean is. If now I take the expectation 1 over m of xm transpose xm bar for any two vector x and x bar, what is it? Okay? It's not true anymore in general that we get something like that. Okay? That's not true anymore. Of course, to make, answer, no, to make sense of this answer, you have to start to take classes of nonlinear right, and try to figure out what they are. So that's one possible direction, and we're going to look at that a bit. The other observation is that now you can write the f of x, which is some w transpose xm. And so what you have to do is that you have to take these vectors, OK? Sorry, these numbers, and then weight them for some vector w, OK? So if you wish, this is just a feature map that depends on m entries, OK? So we can write it down as f of x equal w transpose phi x and think as a random feature map, OK? Or we can write it explicitly and we get sum j from 1 to m wj sigma sigma j x, OK? And ta-da, a neural network. A neural network where it's a one hidden layer neural network with m units and where the inner layer, the hidden layer, is not optimized, but at least in this formulation is chosen uniformly. Okay? Not uniformly. Uh, it's chosen at random. Okay? If you chose it like that, it's doing with respect to a Gaussian. Okay? So 
if you'd go from linear sketching to nonlinear sketching, you start to get expression that you can interpret in a bunch of different ways. You can view it as some kind of nonlinear embedding of your data. You can view it as a random feature map, okay? Or you can view it as a one hidden layer network where you, rather than optimizing both layers and then do backprop, what you do is that you optimize both layers and then you only do whatever you want to do on the last layer. But the last layer becomes a convex problem. So for example, you can go in and do you know, any closed form solution that you like or a simple gradient descent, okay? Now, there is a part of the story that we don't have to add anything anymore. And the part of the story is the one where what you do is that you use this, okay? You fix the inner layer and then you can just go back here and it's the same thing. You just have to be a bit careful with the notation. We just use this new matrix, that, that's all we do, okay? That it is the same as before. You just have to be careful because now you're looking at the parameters over a nonlinear feature map, which is random, but it's the same. So the exact same computation will hold, okay? So we don't have to discuss. It's just we discussed linear sketching and how we reduce computation. Now we have nonlinear sketching, reduce computation. The only bit is that in linear sketching, we knew what we were doing. We're approximating linear functions, okay? In this case, we don't know anymore, okay? Because we do some nonlinear sketching, we have to ask ourselves what kind of uh, nonlinearity are we dealing with. Now, it turns out that you can do a whole industry of, I take an inner product and I show that it can ex be expressed as the expectation of some random feature map or the other way around. So what I mean is the following. We know that any kernel can be written as an inner product. But the inner product might be infinite dimensional. What we want to show is that we want to start from an inner product. We can do two things, okay? We can start from a kernel and try to derive an approximate finite dimensional feature map, possibly random. Or we can start from a feature map and try to see if in the limit it's a kernel. That make sense? So for example, I can take the Gaussian kernel and it's not hard to see that if you now take the feature map where an entry is just a cosine of beta j transpose x plus bj, where beta j and bj are sample according to some suitable distribution, okay? Then this is an approximate way to write down the Gaussian kernel, okay? And this is a one-line computation where what you do is that you take the Gaussian kernel, do the Fourier transform, and then you do the inverse Fourier transform, and you stare at it, and you say, oh, complex exponential, it's symmetry, there is a cosine, fine. And the last part, the cosine part, is a bit tedious, but the first part, which is in the notes in the slides, is very simple. So this is the case where I start from a kernel, and I try to find down an approximate feature map. Of course, what you can also do is to say, what if I start from a feature map? For example, I take this to be, I take sigma, S J transpose to be, guess what? A ReLU. Can I take the a, a, a ReLU unit, okay? So I take that to be a ReLU unit, and then what do I do is that I consider this expression, okay? I consider a, a ReLU unit where the units are random, and then if you wish, I make the hidden layer infinitely large. And I ask myself, what is that, okay? And it turns out that in this case, there is a kernel. Which is annoying to write. And is the uh, so-called arcosine kernel. Okay? And this is an old observation that Raffer Neal did first. And there has been like revamped in a bunch of different ways recently. That an infinite neural network, one hidden layer neural network, is the same as a kernel method with a specific kernels whose shape depends on the nonlinearity that you've used to define your linear network, okay? 
So this says that there's all nonlinear sketching. You can view it as a way to approximate the kernel method or as the limit of an infinitely wide neural network. Okay? For both these cases, all you have to do is have to compute a series, similar to what we did when we computed you know, infinite dimensional kernels. Now, this bit is a bit interesting because, again, in the last 12 months, as you may have thought, somebody started to say, what if now I have a multi-layer network? Okay? Can I write down explicit the kernel of an infinitely wide multi-layer network? Okay? And people not only look at that, but they look at how the kernel evolves through a gradient descent iteration. And there is this whole literature on neural tangent kernel, which is basically a way to show that neural networks in specific regime just reduce to one specific random feature. Okay? A question? So let me just, uh, maybe let's do this. I'm late, so I'm done, and I'm taking any questions offline.